in 1991, uh, Soviet Union got collapsed. It was a very happy moment for all of us, but it was a very short moment because in 1994, Lukashenko came to power. And those four years, it was golden years of renaissance for our country. Business started to bloom, arts been supported by business, so everything made sense. But in 1994, it was over. Uh, the person who came to power is there for 23 years. And uh, in 1999, uh, our friends started to get kidnapped and killed. And in that particular moment, you understand this is it. I mean, there is no way for you to ignore that. You kind of think like that you could forgive a lot of things, but when it comes to the point that people are getting arrested, tortured, imprisoned, and then kidnapped and killed, this is it. At that particular moment when you understand that it doesn't matter whether you are a journalist or a theater maker or a doctor, it's not possible for you to ignore that and you get deep into it. In my particular situation, I worked for the American government uh, and we work um, with different democratic organizations in Belarus. And um, then uh, I uh, did monitoring on human rights violations uh, alongside with uh, our friends from uh, Charter 97 that was established based on the model of Charter 77. Um, then uh, I stood up a uh, trial uh, because of doing that monitoring on human rights violations and uh, we had a list of judges uh, who uh, will give different administrative fees or jailing of people and uh, my judge was on that particular list as well and monitoring uh, will be released next day after my trial. Uh, but I had a very good lawyer and it was possible for us um, to get me out uh, and not to be jailed, so I paid a big administrative fee. But because I had a small uh, child at that moment, uh, it was possible to find a way how not, not to be imprisoned. But later I ended up in jail anyway. It was 2004 when we started conversations about theater and it was a bigger conception. We had a conversation about free Belarus in general uh, and talking about different segments, what has to be free. And obviously when you live under dictatorship, everything has to be free. Uh, you want free theater, free music, free media, and it didn't exist. And one of the ideas was free theater. Uh, and then we just developed that and went ahead. And uh, we simply announced that Belarus Free Theater starts its existence. We didn't have a building, we didn't have anything. We had two amazing patrons. Uh, it was President Václav Havel and uh, Sir Tom Stoppard, who were friends, who knew absolutely in all details what it meant to be under dictatorship and what censorship means. Um, that was it. My uh, husband, he comes from a journalistic background and he ran uh, three major independent newspapers that obviously got closed down. And uh, then he worked uh, a lot in terms of political marketing and organizing big uh, peaceful rallies in Belarus. Uh, been arrested, uh, recognized as a prisoner of consciousness by Amnesty International. And at some particular moment, you understand that everything is prohibited. Whatever you do is prohibited. And it's not only a prohibition of activities, it's a prohibition of your name and your existence. And um, he started to write plays, so it's that particular thing that nobody could, could prohibit you to do. 
and uh, he started to get awards outside of Belarus. And one uh, day, uh, he got amazing royalties. Uh, and we thought that we need to open the theater and bring back names of those writers from Belarus who are banned in Belarus, but already become known outside of our country. And we started international competition of contemporary drama, as we thought that uh, playwrights, they're the best X-ray machines, uh, scanners of uh, any society. First of all, like we organized all our shows under pretext of something like it will be whether a wedding or a birthday and it was based on a model of uh, Václav Havel who shared that model with us that he used during the communism in Czechoslovakia when it was Czechoslovakia uh, and that particular moment we had kind of a second day of a wedding because in Belarus like you have few days uh, first day when people get married and then second, third, you could just have fun. Uh, and uh, in our particular case, we said that it was the second day of a wedding. We had like fruits, champagne and police arrived and said that all of us are arrested. We managed to text to Tom Stoppard to say that we are arrested. And we had foreign citizens with us as well. They've been released very quickly because uh, Belarusian authorities are terribly scared of any international scandals and they're really afraid of uh, foreigners, so they try to get them out of jails as soon as possible to avoid any further problems. And uh, with uh, Tom's help, uh, I think like every single journalist in the world got to know about that. And uh, news started to be spread all over the world. And next morning we got uh, released. When I got released, uh, it was based on a mistake. So they released me wrongly. Uh, and then uh, it was a moment uh, when it became clear that um, like I will come to one particular place and uh, I will leave. And uh, our friends will give us a call and say that police just been here and looking for you. So it became very clear that they've been after me because we organize uh, a lot of events and many interviews. And so like the whole world suddenly started to look at Belarus. And um, that particular moment I understood that we have to go. Uh, but the reason why we had to go, it was only because of our performances in New York. Like, if we didn't have anything scheduled, we will never think to leave. So uh, our New York gig at the public theater saved us for imprisonment. We thought that we are leaving for two weeks. I even remember my father uh, staying, like I, I was uh, in my car uh, and uh, looking at him and he was trying to wave me, but that nobody will notice that he is waving. And it was absolutely, uh, like even now when I talk about that, it's kind of that horrible feeling because first of all, those two weeks got into seven years because for seven years we're not back home. And uh, secondly, uh, our life and uh, what we do uh, brought a huge uh, harm to our family. Uh, like in my father's case, he was a vice chancellor of the Academy of Arts. He was uh, dismissed from there and he was told that his children are a disgrace for the country and he's a disgrace for the Academy of Arts. Uh, then to, later he was beaten up very badly, uh, also like, his temple bone was um, uh, injured. And uh, later he lost his voice and his voice is the major kind of mechanism because he is a um, uh, voice teacher. Now he teaches our students on the ground. My father-in-law, uh, it's even 
worst. Um, we had a meeting with uh, William Haig here in London and uh, Nick Clegg. Uh, been campaigning on uh, release of political prisoners and KGB knew that we are not in Minsk but uh, anyway they organized a raid to apartment of my father-in-law and uh, that particular day he had a heart attack and he passed away so and like uh, kind of it, it, when they raided after the raid he uh, gave us a call uh, and uh, from a hospital already uh, and saying to us that you have to finish what you've started and I think like if we, if we didn't have that particular call like we live with a feeling of guilt any every day uh, anyway but kind of hearing him saying that we we have to finish what we started at least help us to continue to live and my brother-in-law he was severely beaten up his chest was broken and riot police said that uh, it's a message for your brother and sister-in-law if they continue the way they continue it will get worse i even don't talk about kind of death threats like that comes over internet our hacking when suddenly like at my computer i get a virus um, when my camera works when it doesn't work and uh, when you type not sending emails it goes straight into uh, KGB unit um, so it's uh, complex and exhausting but uh, with those particular words of my father-in-law and uh, my parents we are able to continue you watch um, videos from what was happening in Belarus uh, in March and uh, you see how fully equipped uh, riot police uh, dragging uh, children and old people who came to express um, their right for free expression and that particular moment you simply get so out rage with that and uh, when uh, you have those water cannons uh, going against people I remember it was a moment when we had one of so-called presidential elections and uh, my friend uh, who is a very well-known uh, uh, journalist Irina Khalib uh, her husband left uh, who is very well-known uh, politician uh, he went for a specific uh, big conference to talk about human rights violations and my husband was left alone with us and uh, he was told that he needs to look after us and when we got there she said okay we we have to organize a women um, kind of division that will uh, resist riot police and we get to the point when we see fully equipped riot police and we got kind of few women together thinking that they will never manage to go again uh, against women and it was such a mistake because the next moment what i remember it was an explosion of a sound grenade and after that i ended up in the hospital and like i still have it at home that bit of sound grenade and doctor saying once again and you will be deaf so it's but you you can't just stay and observe it and um, you have children and you really understand that uh, it's about their life as well